Hi, Curious People. Thanks for joining me today at the Barnum Museum for a new episode of Curious People Wanted, and one that's a bit different than the others in the series. My name is Adrienne St. Pierre, and I'm the curator here at the Barnum in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So, what makes this episode different? Well, usually I'm sharing the stories of artifacts or documents I've selected from our collection and things that have been here for years. Maybe we're just learning new stories about them. But today, I'm going to share um, something very exciting, and that's when the museum receives a collection, a brand new collection. And what great material this is, it's perfect for the Barnum Museum because it concerns circus performers and stage entertainers working in the 1800s and early 1900s. So getting something like this in is really when the curator's heart sings, right? So I have spread out here a portion of a family archive that has just been donated to the Barnum Museum. This is raw history, you might say, an unprocessed collection of historical material that merits serious attention. This material focuses on several of the donor's ancestors and it's been preserved and passed down in the family for several generations. The earliest material dates back to the late 1850s and it goes up to the I think the first three decades of the 20th century. Because all of this, and there's a lot, has just come in, I still have a lot of material to go through, and it has to be done carefully. As you can see, there are stacks of photographs from the 1800s, some framed items, and uh, scrapbooks, and small books. Um, this collection really illuminates a family history in which there were people from three generations involved in the circus and in popular entertainments of the period. There's a total of seven family members. Uh, and the many people they worked with as well, whose photographs they collected. This collection primarily focuses on three of the family members. And let me whet your appetite with these photos of Edwin Fritz Smith, who was born in Liverpool, England, the son of a tailor, and whose career began at the tender age of eight when he was abruptly put out as an apprentice to serve a seven-year apprenticeship under a very harsh master. His master was merely a street performer, but he taught young Edwin Fritz and other boys all kinds of acrobatic feats, from tumbling and somersaulting to aerial acts, the flying trapeze. These were performed throughout England at music halls, uh, not under canvas in circus tents. And there were no such things as safety nets then. But Fritz, as he was called, excelled. And you can see in this photo taken when he was about 13 or 14, um, he's got a belt there. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but that's a silver belt that he won. So this is Fritz when he was um, 21 years old. And at that time, he was performing with two of his older brothers whom he taught. They went around the country performing. Sadly, one of his brothers died in the act and Fritz decided to um, sort of branch out on his own. He teamed up with another fellow he met and not long after, the two of them decided to leave England and head to South America to become part of a traveling circus. Well, the story gets pretty exciting uh, when they end up stranded in Peru the circus company having gone bankrupt while he and the performers were hundreds of miles away in the hinterlands and far from the coast. Of course, the owner vanished. So this involved an arduous, months-long trek to return to the coast, and it's a harrowing tale of constant danger and near starvation. So um, I'd also like to show you some photographs of Edwin Fritz Smith's wife, um, Kitty. You're getting, obviously, very abbreviated stories here. There's, there's so much. Um, I didn't yet find any actual photographs of Kitty, but in this scrapbook, um, we have a, a nice picture photograph of her. This was an article written when she was 87 years old, living in Saratoga Springs as as uh, she and other family members were also. Now, Kitty was an American six years younger than Fritz, and she was born in New York. She began her career on stage as a very young girl, too, but she performed in a famous and very popular melodrama with her mother and her younger sister. Um, and the family moved around a lot during her childhood. 
And as she and her uh, sister, um, Dolly, grew up, they went on to perform together as clog dancers. Um, I'd like to show you some pictures of Dolly. Um, perhaps Kitty was very similar, but this is a great picture of her in costume and a larger format picture of her just wearing her street clothing. They traveled all over and made names for themselves. And um, I also have pictures of uh, Kitty and Fritz's son, um, Eddie Fritz Smith, named after his father. He was one of five children, and he joined the circus, uh, learning acrobatics from his father. So he and his father and another man named Leslie um, came to perform a, a well-known um, act with this kind of a trick house, and it was a comic sketch, um, but it required a lot of um, physical skill as well. So um, Eddie Fritz Smith, who went by the stage name Fritz, and his son, Eddie, um, they joined forces with another gentleman named Leslie, and they had this great pantomime trick house, which was a comedy kind of thing. So here's an ad for this, um, Fritz, Eddie, and Leslie. And um, it appears in one of these great pieces that, we, that came with the collection. This is a theatrical agent's book, and it's full of different ads. Um, for different, um, not just circus, but other kinds of um, performance, singers, and so on. And, um, you know, if you were a, a theater owner, uh, I guess you could make your choice of who you would like to hire and bring in. So this is a, a wonderful um, book, as are, we got two root books, and maybe you saw our previous episode about circus root books, so if you haven't, check that out. These are wonderful little documents about circus life, and uh, there's one from 1892. This one, Barnum and Bailey, we have um, Edwin Fritz Smith in this as a tumbler and as a clown, and in fact, he was um, the head clown for Barnum and Bailey for a number of years. Now, um, he met with an accident, unfortunately, so he was no longer able to work, and his son, Eddie, um, found a partner in a man named Cornala. Um, and Cornala served as the straight man to his comic act as clowns, and uh, have some great pictures here of the two of them. So, Eddie is the clown, and Cornala is the straight man. Another picture. Another one here. And, you know, they, they, had, uh, they had photographs of them in their street clothes, too. So this is a, a nice big format picture. Um, among these great photos, um, we have Eddie here, a studio portrait. But I love these studio portraits that, that show him um, first just seated on this stool. And then we have we have him in action here. So, wonderful pictures. Now, the, um, the Smith family, that is Kitty and Fritz and, and Eddie, um, knew a famous equestrian. They knew many famous people, many famous performers. Um, her name was Linda Geel. And we have this great um, portrait of Linda here um, that was given to us, along with a few photos of her. This is a wonderful costume picture of her. And um, they admired her so much, they even named one of their sons after her, Jill. So um, we have this and this um, poster, which um, is from England, advertises Cornala and Eddie. So their story is they went off to Europe around 1904. And they performed there for um, many decades to, to follow um, through World War I and even into World War II. Um, they were very successful there. Finally, in 1943, during the war, Eddie was able to find a convoy so he could get back to the United States again. 
Um, so that was, you know, I think he kind of left the height of his career at, at that point, and he uh, settled in Saratoga Springs with the rest of the family. But we have, I have lots to learn still, right? And um, there are many wonderful um, uh, documents. Um, even here is a scrapbook, um, Cornell and Eddie. So I think there'll be plenty of reading material there. Um, some great uh, photos. This is a kind of a, a parade, but here's the clown. I guess that's Eddie out in the front there. And a circus photo. Um, and apparently this is an 1889, and Fritz is the second clown on the left there. So now this item here is part of a costume. Um, looks like a cuff. Um, I don't know why just the one piece was saved, but um, we do. I did find among the photos this tiny little family photo, and I think it's supposed to be the, the Smith family. They did have other children besides these two here, but the woman is wearing a costume made much like that. This is this is when you get out the magnifier because you got to see all those details. Um, but it's. Uh, I don't think it's in this photo, but it's very similar, so we kind of get an idea about it. So let me show um, some of the additional material we we have here. Um, here's here's a letter, and what fantastic letterhead that is! Um, Bates Brothers Amusement Enterprises, seasons 1894, 1895, and. Uh, it's just, it's just beautiful and also has a little personal sketch of, a, of the trains and tracks. And somebody made a sketch of Fritz, I assume, because it says sack time, Smitty. So perhaps um, referring to his last name, Smith. So he's asleep. And um, an agreement uh, working for the Adam Four Paw shows. That was another circus competing with, with Barnum at the time. Um, so, as you can see, stacks of material here um, and more great photos. The family um, probably traded photos with other performers because um, many are signed you know, to, um, to Fritz or to Kitty. And so just let me show you through some here. This is another uh, family, um, two father and two young boys, and here we have knife throwers. <laughs> and here's a lady with very long hair. That was popular. There were, you know, like sisters would show with hair down to the floor. And this gentleman. And even um, a, a photograph of the Australian boomerang throwers. And in fact, um, Kitty and uh, Fritz did go to Australia and performed. So there's a wealth of material here. Now I'd like to turn to a question that we often get from visitors to the museum, and this is one you may have wondered about too. People ask us, how does the museum get the things in the collection? Well, in our case, usually items are donated to the museum by individuals or families. The archive we've just received is an example, and fortunately, it was well taken care of. Um, plus, as I mentioned, the family history was also preserved, and that adds a lot of depth to the historical material. Why do people choose to donate items? Well, there can be any number of reasons people decide they want to turn over the stewardship of historical material to professionals. Sometimes they're afraid that what they have will eventually just get tossed out unless they find a permanent home for it. And sometimes they realize that what they have is important to the study of history or a facet of history, and they uh, want to ensure that other people can benefit from having access to the material. And of course, that's what museums and archives do, exhibitions and programs and, and have research archives. Thankfully, now with the ability to digitize material and make it available by, via the internet, um, 
we and other institutions can reach many more people and digitization also allows us to preserve um, fragile items from repeated handling. So that's a good um, preservation point of view. And um, what I'd anticipate we're doing with this collection at some point. Another way we receive items is by transfer from other institutions. Generally, this happens when, say, a library or archive or another museum has something in their collection that is not relevant to their mission. They then look for a museum, say, where the item is a better fit. And last year, we received a miniature satin slipper worn by Mrs. General Tom Thumb from another museum. So you can check that out on another episode of Curious People Wanted. Of course, museums cannot take everything that is offered to them, and one of the roles of a curator is to make decisions or recommendations on what to bring into the collection. So when we are offered something, whether it is an object or a collection of photographs and documents, I have to ask, will having this enhance our ability to carry out our educational mission? Meaning, is it relevant? Does this fill a gap in our collection, or is it redundant? Does it have a compelling story? And does it expand the story of things we already have in the collection? Will this be useful to scholars of interest or to the general public? And does it have solid provenance, that is, a history of ownership that supports or verifies the integrity of the material? That can be especially important with objects, but often with documents too. We also have to consider whether we have the capacity to properly care for the object or archive. Storing, caring for, and, and interpreting collections requires time and money, and we have to be smart with our limited resources. So you get the idea that there is an evaluation process before we accept something. Otherwise, we quickly become a cluttered attic. This collection runs through the gamut of questions with flying colors. It's a treasure, and a considerable part of its value is due to the efforts of the donor to keep the collection intact, to protect the photos and booklets from damage, some of them had been damaged, um, and to seek out and compile background information and family history, and then to find the right permanent home. As I'm sure you can tell, we're not only excited, but honored to have been um, offered this collection. It's just outstanding, and I look forward to sharing it. But for now, I'm thrilled to let you know about this recent acquisition and get a glimpse of a new collection before it's processed. I really hope you've enjoyed a sneak peek at this wonderful material and the tidbits of personal stories it contains. Thanks for joining me today at the Barnum Museum. Stay curious and do check back uh, or subscribe to see new episodes of Curious People Wanted. See you next time.